strategists that specialised in setting up businesses. We understand the client and give them the very best customised advice and strategies to achieve their goals. Visit our website, dkpco.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co. Chartered Accountants. She lays it off to Reza Polaris. It's an absolute peach. Is driving. What a hit from Belinda Rez. Wow. And Sam Kerr has a hat trick. Meet him up. One nil. And welcome to every second of your life. Thank you for watching Same title, same host. I'm Patil Frimpong. This is Josh Parrish. Josh, you worked hard on this intro. I like it. What are your, what are your thoughts behind it? You made it. Yeah, you. Well, you said you wanted a bass-heavy kind of hip-hop vibe, and uh, I wanted something that wouldn't trigger the the old copyright police. So I've gone for a bit of a a bit of a mashup. It's no. Jump around, House of Pain, and uh, I, I, like I think it's it. Oliver Heldens. Well. Exactly. I know I like it. I, I feel like it fits the vibe of the show. You know, we are still developing it, but it's good. Well, we've got some exciting guests today. We have a striker who's amazing and who's in form with a team that just won the title last season, Melina Ayres. And we have one of the best journalists in the country, Anna Harrington, joining us later on. Are you excited for the show, Josh? I am hugely excited. But before we get those guests on, Pakur, I want to ask you your thoughts on the new A-League's anthem that was released. Well, it's a uh, pretty cool track, pretty well, cool clip. Well, uh, you are you a fan? You know I'm a massive fan. Anything TK Meisner, I'm a massive fan. Her last album was great. And I think it's a, it's important for the A-League to get on like artists who actually fit the audience that they want. And I think she's somebody who's really, really good and she's performing a lot in America. And this, the, the, I actually liked the video as well with Marco Tilio. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I liked it. I liked the sort of TV production studio and stuff. It was it was well produced. Um, I'm a fan. And that slogan is going on all the billboards, by the way. I was driving uh, down Victoria Street uh, today on my way to the studio. And what did I see? Here come the future on a billboard. Well, here so, come the you know. future. We... Hopefully, you know, the future, like, works perfectly. I do believe we have on the line at the moment Melbourne Victory striker, Melina Ayres. Melina, how are you? Good, good. How are you guys? I'm good, thank you. And, Melina, thank you for joining us today. Well, I've just got to ask, firstly, is the 2021-2022 season going to be as successful for the Melbourne Victory as last season was? Um, we certainly hope so. Um, it'd be pretty good to go back-to-back. Um, we've got pretty similar squads, so hopefully nothing changes. Uh, Melina, it's Josh here. Uh, tell us about your pre-season preparations and how you're faring a couple of weeks before the season starts. Um, everyone is really excited. Uh, everyone just wants to play. Uh, we feel like we've been training forever because we were in lockdown and we, we were lucky enough to be able to train a bit in lockdown. Um, and just be together as a group, which kind of was really good to just get out of the house. Um, and then coming into pre-season, everyone was just really excited to get back in that professional environment. And now it's, it's, it's kind of crept up. It's only 10 days away kickoff. So, yeah, everyone's really excited. Uh, speaking of getting out of the house, I think everybody in Melbourne can relate to that feeling, uh, Melina. How has uh, this year been for you with the lockdowns and the, the truncated uh, MPLW season? Yeah, it was it was disappointing to um, not be able to play a lot of that. Um, yeah, I was excited to be back at South Melbourne for the year and we got a few really good games in and we were travelling well and then, yeah, we just got, got back into the lockdown again and it was, yeah, it just kind of sucked. So I guess that's, that's the only way to describe it. Well put. Well, Melina, I know you're an avid surfer and I was watching a video with you and Laura Brock and you said that you were still trying to find somebody to surf with because she was overseas. Have you found somebody to surf with? Not yet. I've been trying and people want me to teach them, but I'm, uh, yeah, looking looking for a surf buddy still. 
Ooh, uh, I actually uh, interviewed a W League, or oh, sorry, A League women's player. Josh, I got to get that's that a right. Coin in the jar. Yeah, again. That's, I'm on. putting a coin in the swear jar for that, Melina. Uh, but actually, we were interviewing uh, one of your crosstown rivals, uh, Kiwi striker, who's just signed for Melbourne City. He's a keen surfer, but I don't know if those kind of off-field uh, activities can cross the Melbourne divide. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe if it was just in the surf, we can you know, get past it and just have a good <laughs> surf and then, then not talk to each other once we're back on land. Well, I've got to ask them, Melina, who is a better surfer, you or Laura? Oh, Laura. Laura's better. She's got a few more years of experience than I do, so that's what I'm going to put it down to. Oh, well, that's fair. That, that is fair, I guess, but I, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't sell yourself short. So one where, place where you are absolutely dominating is on the field. You are scoring goals for fun, what I would last was last episode we asked Mackenzie Hawksby what her favourite type of goal is if it's outside the box or inside the box. What is your favourite type of goal? Um, I think I don't know. They're all good, but I guess hitting a good one in the top corners more fun than a tap in. But Jeff Jeff always tells me I need to get five tap ins a year and then the rest will come. So. I guess <laughs> goal's a goal, but, yeah, the, the long ones are pretty fun. Well, you do have a bit of a, a burgeoning reputation as, uh, as a long shot merchant. Uh, you've scored a few over the, over the years. What's your favourite goal that you've scored uh, in the Colours of Melbourne victory? Um, I think it has to be in the derby at, uh, out at Epping when, yeah, I sort of got off Alana Kennedy and then chipped it over Lydia, um, and I think my favourite part of that, there's a photo of Lydia getting the ball out of the goal and my dad's in the stands, like, jumping up and down. So, yeah, it's probably my favourite one. That's good as. Uh, Melina, it, it must be a pleasure to, to be playing for, uh, for a hometown team, uh, being a Melbourneian as well. I mean, uh, not that many uh, Victorians have been breaking through uh, to the top fly of women's football uh, of late, uh, particularly Melbourne City, have recruited a lot from interstate. So it's nice to have that uh, that VUC, that Victorian contingent there. Yeah, I'm super proud to be Victorian. And, yeah, we're sort of battling down here a little bit. But, yeah, I'm proud to fly the uh, Victorian flag high and hopefully, you know, get us a bit more recognition down here. Well, Josh, I know the reason why Melbourne Victory got her. It's because she's a winner. She's been winning since she was. Um, let give me, if I'm mistaken, correct me. You went to McKinnon High School, and you guys were dominant in the women's football. Is that not correct? Yeah, we had a we had a pretty good team there. Well, well, pretty good is an understatement. You said you were winning in year nine, and then you went. We're winning at South Melbourne. You're winning for Melbourne Victory. Even won with City. Where is this winning mentality coming from? Um, I think that's just why I play. Like, that's, it's the most fun. It's like the best day ever when you do win. So I guess everything else kind of just is worth it in that moment of winning. So, yeah. I mean, is that something that's been instilled in you by particular coaches or is it your parents? You mentioned your dad before. Yeah, dad's pretty, he's a sports nut. And I, I guess, yeah, it's probably from him, like, He's just always, we've always watched sport together and it's always, you know, been a better car ride home if we win. There's not, not as much analysis, so, yeah, could be that. <laughs> What's the post-match song in the car with you and your dad if you do win? Um, post-match, I probably, he used to always play ACDC Thunderstruck before a game, so... I, we'd probably play that one after too. It's just you can play that song whenever you want, really. And that still goes pretty hard. Definitely does. We used to use it as intro music for one of our shows. I reckon we should bring it back. Uh, how about uh, post match uh, with the Victory Girls? Uh, is there a, a uh, routine or a ritual for uh, uh, for a win? Um, we used to sing "Horses" by Darren Braithwaite, but. Um, Kyra actually brought in a team song last year that a couple of the girls made up, but I actually can't remember it. We didn't, we didn't sing it that often, but yeah, she, we sung it a couple of times. It was pretty fun, but no, I guess everyone just gets back in the change room and jumps around and plays a bit of music, but yeah, there's nothing too serious. Hopefully we can bring back horses this year. What were the celebrations like after the grand final? 
Um, pretty awesome. It, right, it was just it was a lot of relief, really. Like it had been such a tough season, and it was just everyone sort of sort of breathed out after we just the whole season. So yeah, we had a good night up in Sydney at the hotel, and um, came back to Melbourne and brought it back to Victoria, which was pretty fun. Speaking of Kyra, just before she's um, managed to break herself into the Matilda squad. How do you see yourself getting into the Matilda squad in the future? Um, I mean, it'd be pretty awesome. But to be honest, I I play a lot better when I just think about the game at hand. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's in the back of my mind. But, yeah, I think I do better if I'm not sort of analysing every squad list and, um, you know, should I be there, should I not be there? It's just, I just, I'm happy to be playing and, if my time comes, my time comes. So, yeah, I'll just keep plugging away and see what happens. Probably a healthier mentality than, than me, Melina. I, I raised uh, some Twitter ire when I when I accused uh, the representative squads of being a little bit New South Wales-centric. But it, you don't feel aggrieved at all at being left out recently when, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, inexperienced players getting, getting surprise call-ups. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely... There's players that I've played with and it's good they're getting their chance. Um but yeah, I guess I was probably my best season I've had of W League last year. So yeah, it's like yeah, I don't I don't know. It's, I'm not too cut, but yeah, I'm hoping another good season this year, and maybe I'll get a look in. What do you think that's for your what like in this off season? Have you really worked on for your game to take you to the next level? Um, well, in lockdown, it was pretty hard, but I guess just keep working on my fitness and getting the running in, getting speed sessions in at the track, getting making sure I'm in the gym every week, um, sort of just getting the basics done. Like, it's pretty boring, but getting that done each week and the consistency of it really helps me. So as bad as lockdown was, it kind of did help in that aspect as I could have a routine and stick to it um, with, with not much sort of outside noise. Um, yeah, so I guess just the consistency really helped. And Jeff Hopkins, uh, you mentioned his five tap-ins per season rule. Uh, what other advice has he given you? You'd be hard-pressed to find a, a more popular figure in women's football in Australia. Yeah, he's he's been really great for five years um, with me. And even though he's a defender, he's um, just a lot of sort of off-the-ball stuff like positioning and... Even as a centre back, he can tell me what's easy for him to defend, and what what I can do better as a nine to to get away from my defender. Um, and even just off the field, sort of, I guess culture stuff. We've always had he he picks a he picks a good team based off, I guess the the person and their ability. So I think he always creates that good environment for us to uh, to give us every opportunity. Well, I've just got to ask, you know. During lockdown, there's not much you can do. Were you playing any board games? Because like, that's what we heard from Mackenzie Hawks uh, last week. She said she's playing. They're playing a little bit of Uno stuff like that. What were you doing last uh, during the uh, lockdowns? Um, I couldn't bring my brother to play chess. He wouldn't do it. So I just I just played a bit of guitar most of the time. I got a got an amp and annoyed the neighbours for a bit, so that was pretty fun. What's your favourite song to play on guitar? Um, my favourite one? I don't know. Me and my friend, we learned um, Back in Black, which is pretty fun when you play it with the drums and everything, but... Um, We've had Thunderstruck probably, and Back in Black so far, a bit of an yeah. ACDC head. Yeah, a bit of a fan. Um, and probably the other ones, Purple Haze, Jimi Hendrix, but... Time. Can't play the solo yet. <laughs> so <laughs> keep working on it. Uh, you mentioned chess the there. You, are you a keen yeah. chess player? Uh, does that translate onto the field of play? You think the tactics? Um, not really. Strangely enough, I guess I yeah I, I do better when I don't think on the field. Mm. That's probably when the, mm. the best stuff happens. But yeah, I mean I was in chess club in in um in high in primary school so. Yeah, I'm surprised I'm not better at it. <laughs> I've got to ask, though, like, chess is, to me, seems a bit obscure. Like, how does a kid get into chess? Like, how does that happen? Um, 
I, one of my good friends used to play, and he was like a genius at it. Um, and he was like, oh, come to chess club. So when it was raining at school, at lunchtime, we used to go and play chess. We had like the little timers and everything, and I used to get smashed every time, but it was pretty fun. Speaking from my experience, Bakura, it's being unpopular in primary school. That's how you get good at chess. Oh, no, no, see, Melina, I'm sure Melina's Melina is not was same, a gun but... on the field, so there's no way Melina wasn't popular. Okay, <laughs> the only reason she would be unpopular is because she was dominating everybody. She's like, I don't want to play with her anymore. I'm done. Okay, Melina, I've got to ask before we let you go. With uh, the Melbourne Victory team being so amazing, who is a player in the team that we should look out for, and a, t- a player outside of Melbourne Victory we should be looking uh, at for the season? Um, so inside victory, I would say one of the young girls, Paige Joyce, um, and Alana Murphy, they've been both killing it at training. Um, Murph's been putting a few in the top bins, so hopefully she can get on and have a couple of shots. Um, and then outside, to be honest, I haven't really been focusing on another team, but, um, yeah, I don't know. You mentioned Alana Murphy there. She came out of that FV emerging squad that, that burst onto the scene uh, last season in the MPLW. Uh, just think how exciting, you know, as a Victorian, is that group of players coming through? Yeah, it's awesome. I am so excited to play with them. Like, they've been... Um, I guess I feel like I've kind of grown up and then, like, watch them grow up. I'm 22 and I feel old as, but... Um, yeah, it's awesome to see them. You know, Paige has been... They've both been just plugging away in juniors and it's so awesome to see them get the opportunity this year. And, yeah, I guess in the next few years they're going to be some of the country's best players. Well, thank you, Melina, for joining us on the show. I have no doubt that we'll probably have you back on the show later in the season to talk about how the victory are going. Um, I hope you have an amazing season and thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me on. I'll talk to you guys later in the season. Fantastic. Melina is. Uh, ACDC fan Melina is. I, I wasn't expecting it, but I do like it. You know, I love to he have a little bit of, you know, ACDC on, you know, just for just for a good vibe. And, you know, Iron Man got me back into ACDC. <laughs> I, I think that that kind of hard rock uh, goes nicely underneath the compilation of Melina Ayres' Long Range Strikes. Yes. It's... Uh, it's a bit. It's a bit heavy. It's a bit well, rocking. You guys had the uh, soundtrack for Lisa Devana. Devana. Oh uh, yeah. I think this I might that. be the soundtrack for <laughs> Melina Ayres. Well, Josh, we'll head to an ad break, and behind the ad break, we'll have a great, great journalist in Anna Harrington, and uh, we'll have a chat about the Matildas' upcoming match against the United States. Whether you're a land developer, in local government or a service authority, Lanco Group will help you get your job done on time and in a cost-effective manner. Lanco Group provides superior civil engineering and advisory services by creating, communicating and delivering sustainable, efficient solutions. For all your infrastructure requirements associated with residential, commercial or industrial development projects, visit our website lancogroup.com.au or give us a call today on 1300 152 626. Are you looking to change your destiny in life? Be your own boss? Start your own business? If you are, you need people who understand your needs and are committed to helping you make it happen. At DKP and Co Chartered Accountants, we are more than just accountants. We are business advisors, taxation consultants and strategists that specialised in setting up businesses. We understand the client and give them the very best customised advice and strategies to achieve their goals. Visit our website, dkpco.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co Chartered Accountants. I'm Kristen Bong and Jason 
journalist Josh Parrish. Hey Josh, we've got a pretty good journalist. I might, I would say, amazing journalist in Hannah Harrington joining us. And uh, thank you for joining us today. How are you? Good, thanks. I'd have been happy with pretty good, uh, let alone the, the bigger compliment. But no, I'm great. Thanks. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on. We're, we're going good, and I like we shouldn't. You shouldn't undersell yourself. Let's be real. In the press box, you're comfortably. I would say the best journalist in there, but that's just my opinion. You know. <laughs> That's just me. Shots of Joey Lynch? No, no, no. Sh- no, no, no. The only reason I'm shots of Joey Lynch is because he's a cat man. Otherwise, maybe you would be even, you know? You can't, you can't support people who like cats. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Oh, I'll just leave them. It's good to keep Joey's feet on the ground too, I reckon. Yeah, you know, got to humble him. Um, well, Anna, the Matildas, 10 days, they go up against uh, the United States. They don't, have a pretty, they don't have a good track record against them. What do you think is the key for them to hopefully maybe turn it around and get another win? I mean, defensive showings are always going to be the question over the Matildas, how strong they can be defensively. It's a really interesting time for for both teams, especially the US. The squad they've brought out is very young, um, a lot of fringe players as well. They've left a lot of the big names. Think you, Sam Mewis, Megan Rapino, Alex Morgan at home. Uh, they want to test some players. They want to see who's ready to go. And it's almost a, a perfect lead-in for the Matildas heading into the Asian Cup because obviously players who don't have a consolidated spot, they're hungry. I was talking to Steph Catley about this as well. They're out to prove a point. They're hungry for a spot. So we should get a really good intensity. Um, it should really be a good chance to get that first win over them since 2017, which is still the only time they've beaten the US. It's very much take advantage of this home crowd. They're aiming for a record crowd in Sydney. Um, pretty relatively close to full strength for Matildas. I think the main query is over Alana Kennedy, who picked up a thigh injury. Um, weirdly doing, I think, the the extra top-up runs um, after a Man City game the other week, but she has flown into camp. So I guess we'll wait and see. It's They should be entertaining games, to say the least. It's a, it's a good chance to get that victory. But, I mean, the main thing they'll want is to get real preparation ahead of, as I said, January's Asian Cup. What do you think of some of these selections here? Obviously you said almost uh, full strength, but there are a few wild cards, a few bolters, uh, like Jessica Nash, uncapped. Uh, what do you think of those players uh, making the cut? Yeah, um, Jess Nash is a is an interesting one. I think the main thing they'll be hoping for, and we saw Charlie's role as well, called in, is to give those players who they probably rate as future um, Matildas, unless they absolutely light it up in training this week, I think it'll be more about giving them a taste of the experience. We've seen 12 debutantes already this year. But, you know, we've seen Briley Henry make a few appearances and she stayed in the squad. But they're very sort of cameos. I think they want to see, you know, what sort of medal some of these kids have. And, it gives them a taste. They go away. They know what to expect. They know what level they have to reach because often it can be such a shock going from W League or young Matildas to the senior level and they get they get that taste of experience. And there's really no better way to, to do it than on home soil as well. They're comfortable, not too far from family. They can try and make an impact. Do you think there's anyone who's been hard done by no, not getting a chance? I mean, we just spoke to Melina Ayres before. She's not still on the line anymore, so you can say what you think. But uh, <laughs> do you think she's been unlucky to miss out? It's tough, isn't it, when you've got so many forwards and they, they've clearly been very happy with what Remy Seamson's done. I'd like to see Melina get a call up at some point and you'd have to think if she has another big W League season backs up, she'd have to come into the frame. I've seen a bit of talk about Alex Chidiak, but um, I think the in, the interesting thing with Chid is she's not really playing a whole lot in Japan. She's not played a lot of football over the last few years. And I know there's, that we're opening on our end in terms of a bubble with Japan, but if she came, played went back she'd have to quarantine again I think she's done something like six weeks worth of hotel quarantine in two years so imagine there's a level of a balancing act there too um yeah I think also maybe there's a level with Melbourne Victory will probably be quite happy that one of their key players is going to be sticking around for this week as well that Courtney Nevin and Cara Cooney Cross are both heading off to Matilda's camp you've got Melina there who's going to be a real focal point of their forward line again but yeah I think Melina is probably a good shout but She's a sort of player that if she can back up what she did last year, they'd have to start thinking about it because we know she's a goal poacher. She can score goals from just about anywhere. And last season we saw her start to round out her game. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to keep players hungry though, um, Josh. We saw Claire Wheeler had a good W League season, was that A League women's season, didn't get called up, went over to Denmark, had a really good stint with Fortuna Huring where she's playing really well now, called up consistently in squads now. So... It'll be interesting to see, um, yeah, if the if we see more come up maybe after the Asian Cup. But 
yeah, not not too many hard done by when a lot of players are fit and ready to go, I think. You mentioned Chidiak there. I feel so sorry for her because she's gone across to Japan and they're playing her at left wing back if they're playing her at all. And then she's being left out of squads on the bench. I mean, we've all seen Chids play. <laughs> I don't know how they thought they were signing a left wing back, but uh, she's just had so many moves uh, that have gone wrong for her. I mean, the Atletico Madrid thing was very much hyped and, and she... Uh, was playing at a very good club, but she barely got any first team football. And now this to the the Wii League in Japan, it just seems like bad timing. On you know, essentially not the eve of a, a women's World Cup, but you have to start getting in the mix if you want to make it. Well, and she had that shocking injury as well when she was over in Spain too. So she was playing catch up a bit. She had a really good time, um, as we saw with Melbourne City last season. Um, but it's difficult. And you look at how many um, players are in the mix now. Kyra Cooney Cross is arguably. Um, well, not even arguably, I think has uh, leapfrogged her in the pecking order quite comfortably. And we've seen Claire Wheeler get a chance recently. And clearly there's the incumbents as well. So hopefully she can, um, yeah, turn things around because we know the class she has and she's a, a great person as well. So fingers crossed we start to see a few things uh, really go right for her. Do you think it's she might need to come back to Australia or even have a look at um, over look at European opportunities again to regain a little bit of confidence in her play to make it back into the midfielder squad? Maybe. I mean, I can't speak for her. Like, it clearly worked um, last year in the sense that she did get back into those Matildas training squad. Amy Harrison, another one who's been overseas but isn't cracking into the squad at the moment. It's It does seem to work for some players to come home and then go to, say, Scandinavia. Um, but, I mean, I can't speak for, for Chids and what's best for her. Um, she, if she's enjoying what she's doing in Japan and feeling like she's getting something good out of it, then it might work in her favour and, yeah, it might, it, things might work out in the long run. The good thing is she's still young. Like she's got a lot of football left in her. So, yeah, we'll see her at some point, I'm sure. Well, with, with Tony G as the at the helm, it looks like the Matildas are playing decent football but not out of this world and they're sometimes look, looking a little bit weak defensively. Do you think this uh, game against the United, these two games against the United States, he will mix it up even with Alana Kennedy potentially not playing? It'll be interesting, won't it? Because we saw against Brazil reverting to that 4-3-3, which just releases Ellie Carpenter and Steph Catley to do what they do best. And as I said, I was speaking to Steph about that um, the other day and she was just, for, for AOP, she was just relishing getting back up and down, bombing down that left-hand side. And we know what Ellie can do on the right I think they, they've been testing out a few things. Like they had to really shore things up centrally at the Olympics, as we saw when they tucked in Ellie into that into that back three. They're testing out a few different things. Um, I think they'd all agree that they don't want to concede goals as easily as they have at times. Um, but I think that's going to be a whole a whole team thing. Um, I think what they've talked about is very much about defending. Sorry, defending from the front and letting that sort of go through the team. But you're not, you're not going to get a more difficult opposition in that sense in the US because they're so fit, they're so physical. Um, you've got a lot of players, as I said, that are very hungry and keen to prove a point, especially forwards when you've got some of their key names and even your Mal Pews and that not travelling. It's, it's a really good chance for some of their players to stake a bit of a claim. And it's, it's going to be a really good test. It's, it's going to be very a couple of very, very interesting games, I reckon. Mary Fowler. Discuss. I mean, she's wowed us all, but what is her best position? Does anybody know? Does she know? Josh, I know. I said it. I said it after the Olympics. You I did, did say it. I just want to know. I did say it, okay? What, what did you, what's your argument? Go she, on. I think she should be playing as a number 10 in the midfield and just were pushing pushing the play because I think she she's a great facilitator and I think it allows us to release Sam Kerr and Caitlin Ford up, Ford up front, you know, and it just gives us a little bit more freedom. It's, it's kind of like a blessing in disguise isn't it like I don't have to have the selection headache it's, it's like honestly like she's so young um it almost feels like they don't need to specialize her like she's grown into playing in the midfield and the thing that they've been really impressed with that Tony's been really impressed with that he's talked about um is how uh Mary Fell and Kara Cooney Cross falls into this category as well has really improved her defensive running and it's the little things that really top class players learn and that's something you obviously have to do if you're playing as a top forward, but also as a midfield, you have to be able to do all those runs. You have to do the defensive track and she's getting that all right. But yeah, we've seen a couple of the balls that she can put through creatively are fantastic, but then she can finish so well as well. So it's kind of, it's, it, I, I mean, I don't know what to do with her. You can just kind of play her where you feel, I guess, and we'll see where she develops. Like it's good to have that flexibility knowing she can play sort of anywhere 
as a forward, obviously Sam Kerr is going to be the main forward, but they seem to have started to work together really well and started to understand each other's games. And we saw her, her goal, the header that Emily Van Egmond picked her out. And, you know, when you play her forward, you can release, Van, you know, when Van Egmond's released to play in that creative midfielder role, you can have Fowler getting on the end of them. So there's so many options. Like, mm. it's just exciting. It, it makes it unpredictable. It gives you options. And I don't have the answer to where her best position is. I think you just take advantage of the flexibility you've got. And as she gets older and matures and, you know, like finds what her actual place is, I'm sure the answer will actually come to us rather than trying to maybe lock her into one spot or another. I'm I'm on board with her playing her in the midfield, at least while, you know, Chidiak's not in the picture, while Katrina Gorry's not in the picture, because having that creative midfielder who can spot those passes, I think is really important. And maybe uh, we have forwards who can run onto those passes, but uh, don't have that many players who can pick them out, especially with uh, Kyra Cooney cross playing in this new deeper role, this number six position. Well, the thing as well that we've got for these USA games is Hayley Razo's back. Mm. And she, she had that shoulder injury. And she basically came off the bench and scored a couple, assisted a couple, just set the game alight the other day. And I think people have almost forgotten what she can bring as well in terms of that hard running, hard pressing. I think Tony Gustafson said she's their best defensive forward in terms of pressing from the beginning. And that's so invaluable. And when you've got more players who can play a role like that like you say you can pick and choose a bit where you want mary fowler to play but she seems to be thriving in this mix of playing a bit in the midfield a bit up forward and it's it's really exciting to see the way that her her development is being carefully handled at matilda's level um i remember tony saying to me before the olympics that players like kyra and mary because they're young you don't want to put too much responsibility on them you kind of want to just let them go out there and play and sparkle and do the you know do their thing and make an impact in their own way. And I think that seems to be the right way to approach it because she's, she's certainly showing plenty so far. Well, speaking of Hayley Razzo, she's not the only Australian doing well in the FAWSL. Her, Sam Kerr, Mackenzie Arnold all made it into the FAWSL Team of the Week. How do you see the Aussie, Aussie play in the FAWSL this season? I mean, it's, it's a Sam Kerr show, isn't it, really? Like... She's just been fantastic. I mean, we're, we're in a fortunate position, I think, compared to last season in the sense that last year we really saw Sam and Caitlin Ford take centre stage. And also um, Emily Van Egmond was very good for West Ham. But this year it's been really good seeing Steph Catley fit and firing. Um, Mackenzie Arnold's an interesting one because she um, obviously is almost seemingly always on the fringe with the Matildas. She was very unlucky last camp where she um, tested positive for COVID-19 and had to miss the last game. And she's thankfully okay now, but she she smashes it for West Ham. She's regularly, regularly, I think, one of the best goalkeepers in the FAWSL, very good shot stopper. She seems very confident and assertive, and I think that's probably the confidence of knowing you're the number one goalkeeper as well. So hopefully we can see her maybe start to translate that into pushing pushing again with the Matildas because I think Tegan Mark is probably the one we're more likely to see in these friendlies because she's over injuries. But the more we can have those goalkeepers pushing each other, the better. I mean, Sam Kerr is just kicking on from what she did last year, isn't it? Like, we're not really surprised to see that. I don't think he... She's not the sort of player that you can just figure out because in that Chelsea system, they've got so many good players and they link up and they combine. And if she's not, you know, scoring the goal, she's providing it. She's not just a one-trick pony. So... It's exciting. I mean, I think we expected these players could could do the thing again, and I mean, they are. Like I said, Catley's the one that probably excites me the most because she had such a bad run with injuries last come on, year. Come on, Anna. That's what I'm talking about. That's all I want to hear. I want to talk about these Arsenal players. Yeah, Steph Catley, I, I just want to be said, last season Arsenal, you know, it was, a, it was an iffy season. I think her coming back from injuries really opened up Arsenal's play, and I think it's a really big reason why we are sitting top of the table and why we could potentially um, win the league, especially why we've got Manum. Uh, I know sometimes you don't watch the FAWSL. Shame on you, Josh. <laughs> but she's really slotting back when Steph Catley's going forward and it's really opened up Arsenal's play. I've got to ask about Mackenzie Arnold, though. Is uh, Tegan Mike had an amazing season with City last season. She's almost leapfrogged Mackenzie in a way. Is there a way for Mackenzie to become the number one option because Lydia's not really playing for Arsenal that frequently unless we're playing the Champions League, which I think her role may decrease as we go further into the competition. Is there a way for Mackenzie to get maybe that number one or even solidify that number two spot? 
Oh, definitely. I think there's no doubt about that. They, Tony's not been very reluctant to refer to anyone as the number one goalkeeper. Um, I think we saw Tegan Micah clearly earn that mantle during the Olympics, but she's had a, some injuries and stuff since, so we've not seen her feature. I mean, based on club form, Mackenzie Arnold has been fantastic. I think, I, again, I can't speak for her, but if she can find some confidence and consistency when she does put on the national team shirt, that may help. I think it's, it is, as we know, it's difficult for, for goalkeepers when you're the number two or the number three and you don't know when you're going to play. And then when you do play, you feel like you've got to prove something. It's very different to just being the number one at your club where you know you're the number one and you've got that ingrained confidence. I mean, she's clearly in our top three goalkeepers at the moment. I don't think she's getting overtaken in that sense. And she's still very young, like, you know, mid-20s. There's no reason why she can't still keep herself in contention. The good thing about all three goalkeepers is they all have very different strengths. So it's um, it's quite exciting in that regard. I think for mine, if if fit, Tegan Michael would be the one I want to see, just because we haven't seen her really since the Olympics. Um, but I mean, there's no reason why Arnold can't be the number two. But as I said, Tony seems very keen on not putting them in a numerical order as such. So I guess we'll see. We may well see two goalkeepers in the two games. That wouldn't surprise me either. I want to talk about the other end of the pitch. Sam Kerr, obviously on fire for Chelsea, playing in this sort of Chelsea super team uh, where she's the the end point of all that good work. Should she be playing a slightly different role for the Matildas uh, given that you don't quite have the star power around her in this national side? You know, see it a lot with, with players playing in different position for their national team or a slightly different role, um, you know, when they go to international football. I feel as if Sam Kerr, in, in some of these games, we've seen her a little bit isolated, uh, too many long diagonal balls heading her way, too much of a reliance on crosses and her ability in the air and not enough of her collecting the ball and running at defenders. Could we see a little bit more rotation in the forward line, a bit more coming deep so that we can actually get Sam Kerr involved against the US? I think we saw in the Brazil games um, that we didn't have that much of a hit and hope. I think that's where when you have a player like a Van Egmond that we saw come on and have a big impact, or if you've got someone in that creative midfield role, Mary Fowler, as you mentioned before, putting in good balls, players like Catley and Carpenter getting free and being more natural in terms of delivering the ball, that helps. Um, Caitlin Ford, Hayley Razzo, mentioned Fowler before, being players that can play off her helps. Um, I don't think they want to have Sam Kerr isolated and have tired players putting in crosses to her. I certainly don't think that's the plan. It's interesting. Sometimes she plays really well when she cuts in. She has a background as a winger initially, cuts in, takes on players one-on-one, and she can be really dangerous doing that. And we see that sometimes with the Matildas when they sort of overlap and have those different sorts of runs, and that can work quite well. I don't think we need to go all in on a different role for her because she's one of the best strikers in the world. It's just getting all the pieces working at the same time. And, you know, we saw what I mentioned before about more solid defence, but letting uh, Catley and Carpenter go up and down. If you've got Ford available, if you've got Fowler available, Razzo available, you can start to gel things a bit more. And that's that's one of the things. I mean, Tony said Hayley Razzo might not play too much in these games and Emily Gionic even less because she had an injury as well. But it's about getting them up to speed and seeing them all link up and play together. And, I mean... Kerr scored six goals in the Olympics, so she's not she's not struggling to score at national team level. So I, I don't think there needs to be a change of role. I think it's just getting it right more so than anything. It's the execution, right? It's very easy to say. Like, mm. the plan seems to be there, but it's making sure the execution is. Well, the Aussies abroad are doing amazing. The A-League women's season is starting in just five days, if I'm not mistaken. What are your thoughts on the upcoming season? It's just exciting to have it back, isn't it? It's, it's going to be interesting how it goes with expansion. I haven't seen a whole lot of the new Wellington team, but it is good the more, you know, it'll be good the more teams we get coming in where you've got the A-League men and the A-League women teams um, that are associated. You don't just have these gaps. Um, it, it's going to be good. It'll be really, I'm really interested to see how Melbourne City um, turn up this year. We saw them beat, they beat Melbourne Victory in a, pre-season friendly, but, you know, friendlies are friendlies and they're pre-seasons, pre-season. I I struggle to see who's going to beat Melbourne Victory. I just think they've got a really, really strong lineup. Sydney FC are always thereabouts. Brisbane Roar have lost a few players. It's quite impressive to me that Victory have maintained the majority of their squad. They lost Angie Beard, obviously Lisa Devanna's 
um, gone as well. But they replaced Beard with Courtney Nevin, the perfect, almost perfect, like-for-like -like replacement. They've had this team training together for months. It, it just seems like if any team is very well prepared to do back-to-back, -back, it's victory. But there's always surprise packets in the W League, or sorry, the A League women. I'm still getting the uh, so two points in the middle. <laughs> this is why you call it the dub. Exactly, the dub. That's why we call it uh, the dub. We've got a swear jar going here, by the way. I, I don't you've know. I guess two, you've, you've put two. Oh, and you put two coins in there. Come on, we've got to be better. <laughs> we've got to be better. The A League women or the dub. Um, it's yeah. There's always surprise packets. You always see a team come up out of nowhere and make a big impression. Camera always going to be dangerous when you've got players like Michelle Heyman. Um, Adelaide always have seemed to be very switched on of late and they're still looking to that first final spot. It's going to be exciting. Like, I'm keen to see it all come together. And, yeah, it's I mean, I'm excited for the season. Double headers. Uh, is, it's a hot topic amongst women's football fans in Australia. I like them because I just see in the press box, it just makes it easier for journalists to file in both games to get more coverage. Uh, but, you know, there are some uh, W League, former W League, now A League women's fans who are not so keen on them. Uh, what's your view on the, on the double header? Because Victory are going all in on double headers this season. I mean, it's, it's a, you can take a bit from both sides, can't you? You can understand why people who have been A-League women or W League fans for years love the culture and atmosphere and environment that they've built up at games. Um, but the flip side of that is if you have double headers and you have them at good grounds, Amy Park is a great ground. And um, Kayla Morrison, the new captain, did a presser the other day and she basically said as much like they deserve to be playing at good grounds, top tier facilities. You're going to, even if it's only a handful comparatively of the A-League men crowd that come early, it still often tends to be bigger crowds than you have at some standalone games, better facilities, as you say, much better coverage, it's much easier to go to two you know, an A-League women and A-League men game back-to-back -back than it is to head out to Epping, for example. A lot easier to justify coverage. Um, not that you should have to justify covering the women's competition, but you can do both both games back-to-back. -back. It seems to be the way we're going. And the other thing that it makes me wonder is we're hosting a Women's World Cup in less than two years. Um, the A-League women is our showcase. That's our top women's league. You want to be showing that it's being played in good stadiums, that there's good facilities, the players are being looked after. Um, you can't really have cow paddock pitches. <laughs> you have to have good pitches. You have to have good opportunities, good broadcast um, quality for, for these players and to, I guess, showcase this product to the world. So it's, it is interesting. I, I empathise with people who miss going to the dub for the dub. And I think there will be some teething issues in terms of how that affects things like memberships and those sorts of things um, because not everyone wants to go to both games, for example. But mm -hmm. it does seem like it's the direction that we're heading. So pros and cons, but hopefully it can be made into a net positive. Speaking of Kayla Morrison just before, now, Anna, I want to start a campaign to get her on the Matilda squad. That's that's my goal. Oh, that I is think my you're going to have to lobby the Australian government first. That is my life first. ambition, OK, <laughs> at this point, yeah? And what do you think yeah, my chances are of convincing her, you know, it's time to get the green and gold and ditch the red, white and blue? Well, I mean, she's working towards her permanent residency. She said that at Opressa the other day. So you'd have to think that... I'm not sure exactly what the situation is in terms of FIFA rules and how much they can rush through citizenship, the Australian government. We've seen it happen with athletes I'll before. I'll to Canberra myself if I have to. Because <laughs> I don't think she has Australian heritage. It would be, um, yeah, purely, you know, change of nationalities and FIFA perspective. I mean, if she was eligible, she'd be a fantastic candidate to call up. Arguably the best centre-back in the in the A-League women. She's a leader. She's only 25. She can marshal a defence, likes to run with the ball. Yeah, I'd be all on board with that. You see, Just I have to make sure that the paperwork is too. I hear no negatives and only positives. You see, that is what the A-League women's season is going to be. And that is what when we do <laughs> eventually get her on the show, we will have an Australian flag here, OK? We'll have a video montage of all the reasons why she should be in Matildas. And she could take her citizenship oath while she's in the studio. Absolutely, is that, is that okay. <laughs> we'll get, we'll, we'll get it, we'll get, I don't know who we have to get, okay, but we will get it done, okay. Okay, all right, this is the priority <laughs> this season. It's no longer a radio show, it's no, now no, no. just a, a lobby it's, group. It's a We're fan club. Get uh, get Peter, Peter Dutton on the line and see what you can do. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> now, Anna, before we let you go, uh, I'm going to make an ambition to ask everybody who comes on, who are two players that you think any 
fan of the W League or A League W. Swear jar. I know, I know. I'm sorry. We need a sound uh, should effect be, for it. <laughs> should be looking out for. Oh, uh, under pressure. Um, I'm sorry, I apologize. Top of the no, dome, no, who comes okay. to mind? Who's, who's exciting you? Pretty I sad. mean, yeah, I can't cheat and say Kara Cooney Cross, can I, because I saw her last season. No, I'm really excited to see Courtney Nevin at Melbourne Victory because we've seen her play for the Matildas as glimpses. I just think she's got so much potential and it's going to be really exciting. And another player, um, I think Briley Henry, she's playing for the Wanderers, right? Like... What sort of confidence do you get from getting your first call-ups at such a young age? Like, surely you can only kick on from there and try and make a real impact in the season to come. So, yeah, I think I think those two, on a like a non-young player basis, I'll be interested to see how Hannah Wilkinson goes at City, the New Zealand international, and obviously Stoddy. So there you go, we've got four players. I want to see Rebecca Stott come Thank back you. and make a big see, impact. Anna's out here. She's got the name. She said she was under pressure, but she just she kept Rattled listening. If off. we gave her twenty more minutes, she would have listed off every A League W star there is. Um, Josh, do you have anything else to ask our amazing guest today? Not really. I mean, what's your score prediction for for the first USA Australia game? I guess that's uh, it. Go with the the ever boring score prediction of two one to the Matildas. Would you would you win? Do you win against them? So it's a young squad. It's, it's a young squad. It's um. Young USA you know, squad. They've had to, they've had to do young USA squad. They've had to do the travel. I think our girls are a bit more used to that. We'll see, but yeah, you can't you can't go against can't go against the Matildas and. It, there's no time like the present to turn that winning record around. Well, do you reckon they'll ever decide to let us play a game in Victoria? Because that's all I'm waiting for. I don't want to play, play. Like, I would love to see the Matildas, but, you know, I don't want to go up to Sydney, you know. Will they kind of let them come down to Victoria? One day. Maybe not till the World Cup. So. Disappointing. It hurts my feelings. Well, Anna, thank you for coming on with us. And uh, we'll be sure to have you again because, you know, you, you know your stuff but better than I do. I'm, I'm not, no offence, Josh. Anna knows more than the of us. Come on. Yeah, fair so, enough. So thank you for joining us, Anna, and uh, whoever you want next time. Thank you for the compliments, and I'll have to find a way to uh, pop a couple of dollars into the um, A-League women's swear jar. But, no, thank you for having me, and, uh, yeah, looking forward to the Matildas games. Thanks, Anna. Thank we'll go to a break and then uh, come back and uh, round out Radio Dub for the That's evening. Right. Whether you're a land developer, in local government or a service authority, Lanco Group will help you get your job done on time and in a cost-effective manner. Lanco Group provides superior civil engineering and advisory services by creating, communicating and delivering sustainable, efficient solutions. For all your infrastructure requirements associated with residential, commercial or industrial development projects, visit our website lancogroup.com.au or give us a call today on 1300 152 626. Are you looking to change your destiny in life? Be your own boss? Start your own business? If you are, you need people who understand your needs and are committed to helping you make it happen. At DKP & Co Chartered Accountants, we are more than just accountants. We are business advisors, taxation consultants and strategists that specialise in setting up businesses. We understand the client and give them the very best customised advice and strategies to achieve their goals. Visit our website, dkpco.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co Chartered Accountants. Cambiasa. This is where Argentina can be very patient indeed. I've watched their youth teams do this. Just play the ball endlessly around the edge of their opponent's penalty area, then suddenly break with devastating consequences. Saviola, Cambiasa. Cambiasso, they've done it, they've done it, and scored a fantastic goal. How many passes did they put together there? You'd need a calculator. FNR, Football Nation Radio. Pickett, she lays it off to Reza Polaris. Radio, radio dub. Josh.
gosh. Honestly, I love the intro that you've got for us. And the more I hear it, the more I feel like I'm out on a night out on Chapel Street. I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. <laughs> it's a good vibe coming back into the race. It is. It is a good vibe. Well, unfortunately, we're a bit of a down down a note to end the show. We've got some uh, some injury news. Yeah. From a, a, an FNR favourite, I have to say. One of the favourite guests yeah. that we've ever had on. Just the most lovely, bubbliest, uh, funniest personality uh, really thoughtful follower of the women's game as well. I remember when we had her on a few years ago, she asked if she could stay on hold just so she could hear what Bobby Despotovsky was about to say. <laughs> and I said, you can listen on the app. She said, I'm already on. Just put me back on hold. I'll be able to hear him. I'm like, oh, all right, Ellie. Ellie Brush, unfortunately, succumbing to yet another serious injury. And uh, she's taking on a coaching role uh, while she recovers. So our hearts go out to yeah. Ellie Brush of I Sydney FC for her recovery. It's, it's upsetting, you know, especially, you know, after she was just injured all of last season. Um, but I, I'm happy that she's staying on with Sydney and Sydney are keeping her in the fold, you know, a little bit tighter than as opposed to just her doing on the her fix, her recovering from her injury on the fringe, because I think that they've got a relatively young squad with a few players leaving. So I think they're going to need that little bit of mentorship if they're wanting to repeat last season and even take the the one step further. Speaking of injuries, uh, there was an article that went up on the the new. Digital platform, of keep course. up, keep up. I like about it. Elise Kellen Knight's long absence from the game, and uh, the continual pain that she had after her knee reconstruction. Jeez. And honestly, if you're going to read this, I would recommend having a sick bag on hand because it was uh, very confronting Jeez. and very gross. She had eventually they went in for uh, exploratory surgery in her knee after all other avenues had failed and she kept having this pain and she couldn't play on it and they ended up finding something that shouldn't have been in there just a sort of marble sized bit of bone or ligament or gristle that had broken loose and was just floating around and getting trapped in bits of her knee and uh, there was a picture of it as well it was uh, (laughs) not for the uh, uh, the light hearted, not for uh, <laughs> yeah, be, the faint of heart, but I, I just can't imagine. <laughs> it was like some serious body horror stuff. But I'm so glad that they finally pinpointed the cause of Elise Kellen Knight's you know, pain and uh, chronic pain and injury, and she now has a chance. Um, at this advanced stage, of course, it's not going to be an easy road back yeah. from yet another knee surgery. Um, but she has a chance to actually uh, make a return because if the Matildas could have her available as that veteran presence in 2023, I think it would be incredible. You, it, honestly, it, it's like horrible to hear that's, you know, that's happened to her. Like you've got to ask, like how does that even like happen, you know, for, you know, professional football? And that's just really disappointing. If she would be great to have back in the Matildas squad. I think the Matildas need, they need to find the right balance of, youth and uh, experience, which I don't think they have at the moment, uh, especially when they're they're trying to go up forward. I think sometimes they lack a little bit of creativity and just clinical passes that I think uh, an experienced player would, would have in their bag. Yeah, she's such such an intelligent player with her positioning and, and leadership and her distribution. Uh, apparently the... Uh, foreign object whatever it was they still they couldn't they didn't even know what it was when they took it out it's just this white circle um was hidden on the scans it was so deep in there that you couldn't see it on any of the imaging so that they were doing and her club side uh, in scandinavia were really hesitant to allow her to go under the knife again because they knew they were just pushing back her recovery again uh but uh you know that that's a position that uh, Australia in the meantime needs to fill. And I'm really looking forward to this USA game to see yeah. Kyra Cooney cross play there again because the more she plays there, the more she learns the position, the more she learns the defensive responsibilities involved and how to sort of evade the kind of pressure and targeting that she's going to receive. So, uh, because when sides watch her and get to get to know her importance in that position, she's going to get pressed more often. We saw that in the second game against Brazil. Yeah. Matilda's found it much harder to play out from the back because Brazil identified... Uh, Kyra Cooney Cross as the player that everything was going through um, in that first phase of build-up. Uh, for me, you know, this this matchup against the United States, I think I know we've got the Asian Cup coming up in January, but I don't. That's that's kind of in a weird. I, I know it's a weird thing to say. It's almost it feels like a formality. I think this match is more of a dress rehearsal for the World Cup mm. in 2023 because. I think that Tony J is the time, he's li- getting shorter and shorter amount of time for him to figure out this squad 
and the style of play they're going to need if they are going to want to take trying to get a medal um, medal chance at the 2023 World Cup. I think the Asian Cup is still important because it's a chance for silverware. And oh, of course, know, I don't want to I don't want to preempt it, but the narrative before the Philippines game, we know that that's going to be like uh, with Alan Stajic in charge. I think it's going to kick up a lot of. Uh, it's going yeah. to feel a, mo- a lot of emotion. Yeah, for a lot of and I, I think it's going to bring a lot of stuff out from uh, from under the rug. Yes. Unfortunately, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of media attention on that game because of that narrative. Um, it was funny. We actually interviewed Alan Stajic on this station mere minutes before the draw <laughs> happened. Yeah. So we interviewed him literally 20 minutes before he knew he was going to coach against the Matildas again. I guess he knew it was a possibility when yeah. he took the job. Um, but, you know, Australia uh, haven't won the Asian Cup um, in the women's. Uh, they've lost in the final, of course, famously against against Japan. And um, It's definitely their tournament to lose. They yeah. are definitely the best side, in my opinion, heading into that tournament. They, Japan's always the Jap- big threat. Yeah, Japan's always a big threat, but I, I think the Matildas have got a lot of quality that if they can just play just more consistent and just mm. hold the line, I think they are, for me, that they are going to be the team to beat for anyone else in the competition. A- a- Asian Cup, uh, I think uh, e- the, the women's teams in Asia are a little bit underrated yeah. and sometimes it's more difficult than it should be. Uh, I remember a Thailand game that was really frustrating to watch a few years ago. Uh, the China match where Emily, Emily Van Egmond had to wait yeah. until the last minute to score that ripper goal to take us through to the Olympics. So it's not without its challenges, of course, um, but this USA game, it, it's the USA and it's the high-profile European countries that the Matildas are going to have to beat, it's particularly Scandinavian countries yeah. we had a problem against. Um, if uh, if we're going to win the World Cup in 2023, you know, hey, there's still a long road ahead. Uh, I haven't seen uh, those green shoots just yet. The Brazil game may be a bit of an exception, a, a bit of a step in the right direction, but I'm excited to see Small the progress steps. in the meantime. And, and, and uh, you know, this this pair of fixtures is, is pretty shaping up as pretty yeah. important. Well, Josh, thank you yet again for joining me on Radio Dub. Episode two was ran smoother than episode one. <laughs> episode three is going to be even better with an amazing song, amazing guests. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you next week. And we'll have a, a little sound effect for the tip jar. I think. Yes, I think we, we will. We need a little cha-ching every time one of us makes a faux pas. That's Thanks, it. Bakur. <laughs> That's it. Pickett, she lays it off to Razor Paul.